Hey everyone, I was finally successful in depositing a clear conductive layer onto a microscope slide. So this will be the basis for a lot of my future experiments uh, in OLEDs and other display technologies. So let me show you how I did it. The device that's actually doing the depositing is called a sputter gun. And I machined mine from uh, basic pieces of metal. And I'm going to unscrew it here like this and eventually the whole thing just comes off like so and down in the hole here is a spark plug and it's facing up towards us so on the underside uh, there's the rest of the spark plug of course and then right next to it there's a needle valve with a hose coming off and the hose runs to my argon cylinder so I can control how much argon is getting into the chamber through the needle valve and I can get high voltage into the chamber through the spark plug and the underside of the uh, sputter gun has a, a rod in here that contacts the top of the spark plug so I have sort of a shielded entry into the chamber. The sputter gun itself is relatively simple in construction so let me just take it apart and show it's inside and then describe how the whole process works. So the very outside is uh, called a ground shield and it slides off like this and the purpose of this is just to keep the um, the things that you don't want to sputter inside this. So when the shield is on, the only thing that's exposed to the chamber is the surface of this disc here, which is the thing that we want to sputter to um, send off onto the microscope slide. So if we take that off, the rest of it is built like this, and between these two layers is an insulator. So we'll take this apart, and currently there's um, some changes that I'm going to make to this. Uh, these are nylon screws and nuts holding it all together and nylon is not really a, a great vacuum chamber material. So eventually I'm going to upgrade this, but I'm not quite sure what I'm going to use instead. And so this part is at the um, vacuum chamber case potential. Let's just call that ground. And then the inner part here, this is where it touches the spark plug. This is all at a negative high voltage, let's say a thousand volts negative. So inside here, um, we've got a, a very high potential between this outer shell and the inner shell, but there's a few other tricks here that um, allow us to sputter just the target material and not sputter the rest of it. So I'll open this up. And as you can see, I'm missing quite a few screws because I haven't got the right ones in yet and I just wanted to test this quickly. Inside here is a, a magnet, a ring magnet, neodymium ring magnet, and an, uh, a steel pole piece that I turned on the lathe. And so the idea here is that when the magnet is inserted into here like this, there's a nice magnetic field on the top here. And you can even see um, one that I cracked my disc, unfortunately, so I'm not going to undo the top layer just yet. But also that there's a ring pattern where the uh, disc has been eroded by the sputtering. I've also got some holes in here for a cooling system, which <laughs> unfortunately I didn't have running yet, so that's uh, hence the uh, cracked disc. And the idea with that would be, um, this is a sort of a Teflon hose, it's actually called a plastic called PFA, with, a, with an O-ring on like this, the hose can be sealed up to this, and then with an o-ring in the right spot here this whole thing closes up and I can actually pump water through the copper block. So a lot of sputtering systems um, say they require water cooling and I always you know thought that only applied to like systems that ran for you know eight hours a day. I figured that the thermal mass of this block would be enough to keep me safe for a you know a five minute run but um, as it turns out not quite. Um, I'm not sure if this was due to my clamping or you know too much power or something but I think water cooling is kind of a necessary thing if you want to sputter stuff at any reasonable rate. Okay so let me tell you how this thing actually works. So if you want to make a nice uniform coating on something say like a microscope slide you have a few different options and two of the most common ones are evaporation and sputtering. So in a previous video I described the evaporation process and this entails uh, heating up the material that you want to coat. Sorry, heating up the material with which you want to make the coating. And typically that's done in a metal boat like this. 
So what we do is pass a really high current through here. This thing becomes very, very hot, uh, white hot even, yellow hot. And the material here evaporates and then condenses on the thing that you want to coat. So this is, you know, roughly analogous to boiling water in the kitchen and then noticing water droplets condense on a cold window. Um, the downside with this is that you have to heat up the material to that yellow hot temperature. So if your material can't take it for whatever reason, or if it changes into another material at that temperature, then this isn't going to work. And when we're talking about making conductive ITO coatings, uh, this is definitely the case, where if you heat ITO up in a vacuum, um, as far as I know, it reduces itself back down to uh, base metals, and it, it doesn't work. So an alternative process is called sputtering. And this works by accelerating gas molecules and slamming the gas molecules at very high speed into the surface of the material with which we want to make the coating. And when that happens, at just the right energy levels, um, it actually chips off a few molecules of the surface, off the surface of this material, and they go spraying off into the chamber. And eventually they'll land on uh, the thing that you want to coat. So here's a cross-section view of the sputter gun. The ITO disc is the thing with which we want to make the coating. And then we've got our magnetic pole piece here with north and south poles. It doesn't matter which is which, I don't think. Um, the idea with the pole piece being that the magnetic flux goes through the, the steel and then back up, you know, through here. So the magnetic field lines look like this. This whole intersection here is at about negative a thousand volts, and the outer section is at zero. So when we pump down the chamber to a very low pressure and put our thousand volt potential difference on here, the remaining gas molecules in the chamber will ionize, uh, basically just like they do in a neon sign. And uh, the trick with the magnet is that it concentrates all of the electrons in this area. And it does this because the electrons are relatively lightweight and they have charge. So the uh, moving electrons are affected by these magnetic field lines. In fact, they actually spiral around the uh, magnetic field lines. So we've con concentrated all the electrons in this area. However, it's not the electrons that are actually doing the sputtering for us. What happens is these spiraling, fast-moving electrons end up ionizing more gas molecules. And it's actually the gas molecules that are attracted to this negative potential and hit the surface and cause the sputtering to happen, which is why this is negative and the shield is, is relatively positive, we're at zero. Uh, this negative voltage attracts those positive gas molecule ions, and, and that's what causes the sputtering. The reason that we use argon is because we don't want an incoming gas molecule to react chemically with our uh, material here. So, for example, let's just say we were sputtering aluminum and we had oxygen up here. What might happen is a really energetic oxygen molecule might hit this and create aluminum oxide. It might not actually sputter the material, it might uh, react with it. And sometimes that's desirable depending what kind of process we're doing, but generally you'd want to control those gases very carefully. So for a lot of sputtering we just use pure argon. Uh, the exact pressure at which this whole process works is very critical to determining the success of your coating. So if you have no gas molecules up here, obviously the process doesn't work at all because there's nothing to, to cause the sputtering. That's at a really, really high vacuum. At really, really poor vacuums, if you have tons and tons of gas molecules up here, it's true you'll certainly be able to slam them into the surface However, the high pressure is such a good conductor because there's so many ions, it's tough to get the voltage high enough so that the incoming ions are going too slow to cause the sputtering to happen. Um, you'll have a nice glow discharge and things will look like they're working, but you just can't get the voltage high enough without, uh, you know, blowing everything up, basically. Another problem is that if you have tons of gas molecules up here, when you eventually do sputter off a piece of the material, it's going to interact or it's going to hit those gas molecules. And that may or may not be a good thing depending how your setup is, is configured. So if your surface to coat is kind of up here, uh, you generally want these 
these sputtered molecules to have a, a fairly clear path toward it. If there's so many gas molecules up here that a lot of the sputtered material interacts with the gas and kind of starts flowing, uh, that may be a bad thing because they're going to escape and, and coat other things on the surface of your chamber. It seems in the literature that most people prefer 10 to 100 millitor uh, for proper sputtering uh, pressures, uh, but it's also very common to use a diffusion pump anyway and pump the chamber way down as low as you can get it basically just to clean everything to get the water molecules and everything to evaporate off the surface and then backfill it with argon back up to the pressure that you want. In my first few experiments here I've noticed that controlling the pressure is actually surprisingly difficult and also as the literature says has a pretty profound effect on how the sputter process is going. I've been using an electrophoresis power supply for my first attempts here and it turns out to be a very non-ideal power supply for this purpose. Uh, besides all the uh, stupid safety interlocks that are, make it difficult to use, the uh, supply goes into its current limit condition kind of too quickly and it's hard to get a consistent voltage current out of it. Uh, it is nice that it has a constant power function so you can actually set a desired wattage and then play with the chamber pressure and it will balance the voltage and current without exceeding that power limit. However, I think for future experiments what I'm going to use is just a microwave oven transformer with the standard diode and um, control it with a variac. I've also been working with photoresist and making patterns with it using uh, some UV lamps. So this will be coming up in a future video. Okay, see you next time. Bye.